Welcome to IPC 144 NBB, correct? NBB, yeah. So, uh, uh, my name is Farad. I'm going to uh, bring up uh, uh, the course page and go through all the details with you and uh, uh, try to give you a smooth start on the on the journey that you have at Seneca. So, oh, that's OP244. Oh, it's actually saying OP244 up here. I have to change that. Okay. So, <clears throat> it's the course package coming. It's not 244. It's IPC144. I'll fix that image. My apologies. Uh, it is IPC144. So, forget about that number that you see up there because I copied my content from the OP244 class. That's what came up. So, uh, my apologies on that. It is IPC 144 NBB. Uh, my name is Fardad, as you see up there. Um, <clears throat> F A R D A D. Here we go. <laughs> That's interesting. I went through every single thing to make sure that it doesn't say OP 244, and I didn't see that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, so it is IPC 144. My name is Farad uh, uh, Soli Mandu. You don't need to pronounce my last name. I cannot pronounce my last name. And uh, I um, already, um, I'm, I'm going to apologize for mispronouncing your names throughout the semester. Um, we are in Canada, so barely two people are from the same culture. So it's, the names are completely different. Even when I'm speaking English, I pronounce my own name incorrectly. So Farad is wrong, actually. It's Fardot. <laughs> but when you speak in English, you cannot say it that way. That just the tongue doesn't move properly. So far that it is. <clears throat> so yeah, um, I um, quick thing about your prof, so you know who I am. Um, I have been a Seneca student uh, 30 years ago. Uh, I uh, started teaching at Seneca, I think, around 1997, six or 96, seven, 98. I became a full-time prof. And that's what I do since then. I love teaching. My mother tongue is C++, but I love C language too. So, um, uh, and uh, uh, it's been a while since I've been in IPC 144, but I really wanted to come back once and see if I can actually take a class up from IPC, then I go to OP and 345, and I keep going like that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, so uh, that's me. Uh, uh, for uh, the IPC 144, it's uh, an introduction to uh, programming using C language. Um, and uh, uh, we are going to cover all the basic um, knowledge that you need to be able to successfully develop uh, applications in C. Um, we're going to uh, teach you the uh, basic uh, logic behind programming and tell you exactly what programming is, OK? I'm going <clears> to <throat> do, uh, do polls uh, uh, as I'm going through class. I'm going to ask you questions. And please, um, when you go further and you're going to go to data communication courses, you will see that two communication devices, there are two, there are two different types of communication. One is half duplex, and the other one full duplex. A half duplex communication is when you are listening to music on radio. So the person who's playing the music doesn't know if you're listening to it or not. They just broadcast it and hope that you're listening. That's half duplex. The full duplex communication is a two-way radio. When you talk, you say Roger, and the other one says over. So you are actually telling to each other that I got your message. Or you're going to say, I didn't get that. Repeat that again. So a full duplex communication between two sources one always acknowledges that got the message from the other person. I want that in here, OK? So when I ask you a question, a simple nod like that helps me a lot, OK? But if you're just turning like that over there, to the end, I don't know what happened, OK? So and I, when I pull and I say, who did this, who did that, participate, OK? Let's all work together so we can actually uh, make this thing work properly. Uh, <clears throat> the class is. Uh, set into uh, two sessions per week. Both sessions are 
IPC 144 MDD, but the second session is done in a lab. So the second session that you're coming, there are computers in the, in the uh, room that you're going to get into. So that's our lab, uh, and uh, we are we're going to try to do the labs that I'm going to assign to you, workshops that I've assigned to you in there. But if we don't have enough time to complete our lecture, we might use some of the lab to complete the lecture. So that's that. Um, uh, because I took over this class and I wanted the students to learn in a specific way when we are coming up, your workshops, your project, and things that you are doing are completely separate from other IPC 144s. So I'm going to tell you where to go. So don't do the workshops that they are getting. I'm going to give you my own workshops. You're going to have my workshops. You're going to have my project. You're going to have all the things. I'm going to provide you the things that you need for the semester to go through. And the things we are going to do is going to be somewhat different. So just uh, letting you know that this is the way I teach, and each prof have its, has its own way. So <clears throat> when I explain to you where to go, you're going to go to uh, a place called GitHub. GitHub is essentially uh, an organization that holds, um, uh, it's a place that people put their uh, programs in there, codes in there, and they collaborate, OK? And it's used for many things, including education. So it's been a long time that we actually created in GitHub an organization for IPC 144. And that organization, I'll bring it up. And you'll see everything. We'll talk about it. We'll go through it. So uh, that's the web, web page that you're going to go through to get your material. As a matter of fact, uh, I teach live, which means I program and I teach. So I'm going to literally open my pro, uh, computer over there, teach you, and program it at the same time so you see how the code is done. Do, you do not need to take uh, any notes. As soon as it's done, a click of a button, everything goes to GitHub. So you have access to everything I have done in class. Even the recordings that I'm doing, uh, if I just looked at the microphone to see if it's on or not, goes on GitHub with a link, and it's on YouTube. So even if you go on YouTube and say, C++ Fardad, from, I've been doing this for years and years. You're going to get lectures from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So uh, that's, uh, those are the things. So uh, that's the lab. And, uh, but recordings are not done for recording. It's, it's just for review. It's not for you to say, oh, I'm not going to go. He's going to record it. I'm just going to sit at home and watch the recording later. Recordings are not guaranteed. Things go wrong. Microphone is not sometimes. Sometimes I forgot to just push this button. So make sure whenever I put this one, you see this is red. If it's not, it means nothing's recording over there. Or if it's blinking, let me know to change the battery. So yeah, So and um, sometimes I pause for a break. We come back, I forget to unpause it. And it just doesn't record anymore. So recordings go bad. Okay, And unlike other sections, I don't have many sections of IPC. So if one recording goes bad, you cannot check the other sections. It is gone. So recordings are not a guarantee. Um, be aware of that. Uh, the very first task that you are to do, let me actually, you know what I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to And I'm going to post these things. Um, take a note. It's good that you take a note, but I'm just going to write the thing so, so it is important to install Microsoft Teams. It is crucial for you to have that one, Microsoft Teams. All my help, all my work with you is done on Microsoft Teams. It is much more efficient and much better than one-to-one -one sitting at a table helping. How does Microsoft Teams work? It's an application that is built for collaboration, which means it's like a souped up type of a chat. So you go on Microsoft Teams, and as soon as you log into Microsoft Teams, this is what you see. You are already a member of a team over there, and you don't know it. So if you actually start the Microsoft Teams, if I can find the, oh, that's Visual Studio. That's a different story. Old habit, this is what I wanted, not that. 
So yeah, when you start Microsoft Teams, and it's starting now, don't do, we, if you log into my Seneca and you click on your email, you will see that the web version of all these things are there. Use all those things, no problem. Microsoft Teams, install the application. And I'll tell you what the, what the reason for it. With Microsoft, now it's bringing up my calendar. So these are the busy times that I have. And all the empty times that you see over here are the times that you can book an appointment with me for help and all the good stuff that we want to do. But, so if you actually go to the Teams, in here you will see this is my OOP244 office. And... Where's my IP? There we go. It's down here. Let me bring it up. That's IPC144 Office Help and Collaboration. As soon as you log in, you're going to see that team is in the team section, and you are a member of it. You can actually post information over here, write stuff, start a new conversation. Anything you do in the general tab in here, everybody will see. And that's what we want to do. So if you have a problem, you can't find me, you can simply put your problem over here. Don't put your entire code in there. That's plagiarism. But you can put a piece of your code, say, I wrote this loop and it doesn't work. Can anybody help me? And five different people come, can chip in and help you. And we can see uh, how everybody's doing the work and we can learn that way. The era of uh, a programmer sitting in his basement or her basement with a program, with a, with a computer, writing a program, make a million dollars is past. The, programming, the programs and the applications are so complicated right now that for every and each of them, teams of programmers and departments have to work together. So collab learning to collaborate is a key thing for your future careers. And I'm not mentioning that as a uh, simple thing to just hear and pass through. Listen to me. Uh, we have something over here called Workshop Zero that I have designed it for the um, OP244 and 345. But you are doing it too. Workshop Zero is to make your computer ready for collaboration. And this is an important, important thing to do. You need to learn right from the beginning how to start working with others, how to take care of the precious code you are writing, and make sure you can keep track of every change you make in your program. A program is simply a series of instructions you are going to write to make that dumb, idiot, doorknob, intelligent type of a thing called computer. A computer is the dumbest thing ever. And it's so difficult to communicate with it and make it do what you want to do. But it has one advantage. It's lightning fast. So it's worth it. To go to college, three years, try to learn to make the damn thing do what you want to do because it's going to do it hundreds of thousands times faster than a live human being. And that's why it's worth it. They sit over there for years and years. It's now, for example, uh, you've heard about the Tesla cars that drive themselves, right? They started the autopilot system for it 10 years ago. And after 10 years of geniuses working, lately it's just starting to do its work. 10 years just to drive a car, OK? And this is not like five kids. College students, and these are like genius people whose brain radiation, you can fry an egg on it, okay? It's that type of a people working. So collaboration is key, and hard work to learn how to program your computer is important. And to keep track of all you have done, the changes you have applied, is very important. We're going to go through all that, and we're going to learn it. So, and I know right off the bat, I'm just putting you in front of the... Uh, the, the, the waves of the ocean, and I'm going to tell you, go over there and start surf. I know. The beginning to setting it up, setting up your computer to do the things you're supposed to do, it's a little uh, tricky, but I'll go through it with you. All those people who have Macs, okay? Mac computers. I see many of you, they have Macs. Uh, <clears throat> your job is a little uh, uh, more 
I couldn't say challenging for you, interesting for you. Because the subject is based on Visual Studio. Visual Studio is an application, a program designed to work on Windows computers. It's to develop applications and do stuff like that. It's very helpful for teaching and is one of the top-notch things that exist over there. The equivalent of that one on your computer is called Xcode. Okay? Um, but, but, because you need to learn Visual Studio, you need to learn it. Okay? When you go to uh, uh, Mac OS development, if you, when you go to uh, courses that specifically you create applications for, for, or for uh, um, the, I, uh, the, uh, the iOS um, uh, Apple uh, uh, products, then you're going to learn Ma uh, Xcode. I humbly suggest, although it's not a must, uh, you have many different uh, options, I humbly suggest try to install what is called uh, VMware. VMware is, uh, I'll, I'll explain it again. Uh, we're going to go through it. Uh, VMware is uh, a little program that you install on your computer, and you put a computer in a belly of your computer. And so it's essentially a little computer that you have inside your own computer. On that, you can install anything you want. You can put Windows in your Mac if you want to. But we'll go through it later. Again, it's not important at this moment. It is, it is a future thing that if you did, go Google it. I put some links over there. See if you can install it. Good. If you can't, then go with your uh, Xcode. And uh, there are so many different platforms that you can work with. But anyways, I strongly suggest try and create a, a, a Windows machine there. Or if you have a laptop at home that is Windows and it's not powerful, that's ideal. because. We are not using that much power. You can just get a very cheap, uh, extremely cheap $400 type of, I know $400 is not very cheap for many people, but, uh, uh, and install Visual Studio on it. Only two applications and run that. Yes. Um, uh, we'll go through it. Is that a Mac? OK, so you have Visual Studio Code probably. Yeah, yeah. So Visual, that Visual Studio Code is just for coding. It doesn't do all the other. Other stuff. So it's it's an it's a text editor that you can code nicely in it. But after you're done, we'll come to it. I'll explain. You have to actually compile that code. It doesn't compile for you. You have to go back to Mac and compile it manually, which is very fine. Absolutely no problem. So yeah. Uh, so we are. So this is where everything is going to happen, and we're gonna have all the good stuff in here. One thing that you need to know, I'm going to put new conversation over here, and I'm just going to add over here. Uh, it's kind of ironic if I actually put over here, install MS Teams in MS Teams. I'm not going to do that, because I told you to do it so you can all see all these things. So uh, uh, I'm going to say over here, uh, uh, good to know. So what do we have? The very first thing that you need to know where you go to get all the stuff that I was talking about. Where is the path for that GitHub thing that we're going to have all the stuff? That is here. So you can simply, like, if you forget, if you forget, just type IPC144 GitHub. And the first thing that comes up is the organization. OK? I'm going to put the link over there. Inside that organization, you see IPC Workshop, IPC Project, BTP Workshop. You ignore all that. This is where you go. IPC 144 NBB. This is yours. OK? When you click on this, it comes up over here. And it tells you exactly what I was talking about. My schedule and everything is in there. Your workshops are going to appear in here. Your project is going to be here. Everything I do in class, every single thing I write in class is going to appear in notes in here. So you'll see it. Everything's going to be there. I live and breathe in that thing. So as soon as I'm done with the recording, the recording is going to go there. And you're going to see the list of recording is going to appear right over here. You see recordings of sessions? OK? Just to show you, for example, the end result of how it's going to be, if, uh, 
This is, I think, yeah, this is last semester's for my OOP244. Take a look. These are all the recordings for all the sessions. Everything is in there, exactly the same thing as you have. But this is for OOP244. So everything is going to appear over here, and you're going to have all the sample codes, and you have, you don't have a different section. It's all you. So you don't have an NAABB. You have notes instead. But when you go over there, you're going to see stuff like this. And each one will have all the code that I write in class. So you will see everything. And you can actually open it. It's on the web. You can uh, go through it and uh, copy it and uh, experiment with it. Okay? So in here, I'm mentioning something called Workshop Zero. Why I call it Workshop Zero? It's setting up your computer. Okay? Do the things you need to have. Okay? So you can start up the, the session. Uh, I specifically say Mac users and Workshop Zero, okay? And uh, I uh, mention over here how to install Fusion and uh, uh, install Fusion VMware, uh, and it's free for you, and you can install Windows on it. So if you choose to do that, your choice, do it. If not, uh, the link is provided for you uh, for uh, starting everything up. And uh, <clears throat> so the recordings go over here. There we go. So you're gonna, uh, I'm gonna uh, put it in the announcements over here. So it's this gotta be link to subject notes and workshops website. And I'm going to send it as an announcement to your, uh, to your email, too, so you're going to have it. So I'm going to come back over here and just copy the URL and paste it over here. And that's what it is. Yeah. All right. So. What I ask you to do that in that workshop zero. In the workshop zero, these are the things that uh, we are asking. So if you actually go to the page and click in here, it's a series of YouTube videos. And I'm explaining exactly how to do all the things that you're supposed to do. Install Visual Studio 2022, Git installation, uh, party and all this stuff, but these that you see right down here, these first three are for Windows, but creating GitHub account and GitHub profile, these two are Mac, uh, regardless of what you have. I'm going to, again, set everything up and let you know, uh, send you messages, uh, post it so you know exactly what you're supposed to do. Uh, so the first two... The first two over here, that screen is so high, I can't look at it like that. I have to talk about it over here. So the first one <clears throat> is uh, a program that essentially uh, helps you write C programs in it, OK? And it runs it for you on your computer so you can see the outcome of the program that you have written. That's Visual Studio. <clears throat> the second one, Git installation that you see over there, is the tool that helps you Collaborate, OK? It has nothing to do with C language. It's done in every aspect of computer programming in the world, OK? The third one, <clears throat> PuTTY installation. PuTTY installation is essentially uh, PuTTY is a program that lets you remotely connect to a ginormous computer that we have at Seneca. OK? This computer is called Matrix. OK? Matrix computer is a computer. It's called the cluster. It's essentially a room like this. They put 50 computers. They connect it together. It acts like one computer. All students have, have accounts on it. So what you do, you uh, log in. 
to Matrix, and uh, you can run all your programs and everything on Matrix, as easy as that. Okay? So with Putty, you remotely connect to it. It's a text environment where you issue commands, and it uh, gives you the result of the command that you issued. Operating systems old times were like this, and Linux operating systems still have that command line, where you can actually open a command line and issue commands and ask computer to do something for you. So it's not a GUI interface, it's a command line interface. You issue a command, you hit enter, the result comes out, and it gives you uh, the, uh, the outcome. <clears throat> All the computers in our labs, they have Visual Studio, so you can actually go to our labs, log in, uh, through my apps over there, you can, uh, we'll, we'll demonstrate the next day you are coming in. You can start Visual Studio and work on lab computers too. There's no problem with this. Workshop Zero is not something mandatory that you need to do. But if you do this, when two years from now, you apply for a job, a co-op job or something, what, what, what do they do when they, when they get your resume? Anybody knows? The very first thing they do, they Google your name. That's the very first thing they do. And as soon as they do that, your GitHub account's going to come up. That's a green light to hire this person. Having an account on GitHub, it means I am a programmer who's not only a programmer, but know how to work with Git for collaboration. Huge advantage. So I know it's tough. It's the first week. You're going to go through these things. It's going to be difficult. But uh, I'm going to actually modify the labels on those. So those people who don't have, like uh, any of you uh, has a flavor of Linux, working on Linux? No nerds? Only one? <laughs> All right. So yeah, so Mac, Linux, potatoes, potatoes. OK, so you can actually. Uh, on, Mac, on Linux, uh, you have many other flavors, uh, many other. Uh, uh, development environments that you can use to. Anyways, so uh, yeah, um, so yeah, you, you create your GitHub account, and uh, if you learn to work with GitHub, because now we are doing kindergarten stuff, it's the beginning, we are learning to do very basic things with a language, so it's not that tough, okay? So learning tools like GitHub with simple stuff is easier when it becomes very, when you get in higher semesters and the courses become more complicated, learning another thing at the same time is too time consuming. It's a good time to do that. In install Microsoft Teams and I'll help you all the way through. Okay? With Microsoft Teams, I can take over your computer. Don't worry, I'm not going to open any folder that, I, that I'm not supposed to. But, but yeah, I can take over your computer and I can help set it up for you. As easy as that. Or if your code has a problem, I can actually do that. Although sometimes it's laggy, but uh, I can do that. That's why we have GitHub. If you have GitHub, we don't have to do that. All you need to do is to write your code and push it to GitHub, which means upload. Push means upload. You push it to GitHub and tell me, Farhad, I have a problem with this code. And you add me as a collaborator to your GitHub account. I pull. Pull in Git means download. I pull your code to my computer, show my screen to you, so I'm not accessing your computer, bringing up your code, and fix your code in front of your eyes. Tell you what your mistakes were. Then I'm going to commit my changes back and push it up to GitHub again. Then all you need to do is to pull. Pull is an intelligent download. Don't tell me that you didn't download from internet. All of you did, right? Download is something that when you download and you have an old thing, it overrides the old one, right? Everybody knows that, right? Okay. With pull, is not like that. With pull on GitHub, only new things are applied to your code. So it doesn't overwrite the old code. It just adds the changes to it. Therefore, you're going to have on your computer what I did to help you. And the amazing thing with Git is that you simply go on the file and you say show me the changes it shows what the code was what the code is exactly what the differences are so you can immediately grasp what i did to help you and that's a big advantage so if you choose to do workshop zero it would be amazing <clears throat>
Anyways, I will, uh, as soon as I get home, I'm going uh, to uh, tell you exactly which parts uh, are uh, to be done for, uh, even for uh, Linux users. My friend, you can install VMware and install Windows on it and uh, enjoy the Windows. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, Visual Studio and learn it. Um, anyways, so that's that. Um, yeah. These are workshop zero. Now let's go to the subject page. Faculty information. Again, that OP244 is like needle in my eye. I have to go fix it immediately. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, when we are, when you want to contact me, please don't send me an email. Okay? Emails are crude things, and it gets mixed up with 55,000 emails that I receive every day from all different places. Send a message on Microsoft Teams. So if you go on Microsoft Teams and you type over there, Farnad, my name comes up. Just click on it and open a chat and send me a message over there. It dings me, and I, and I see your message. First of all, the history of our conversation will going to be always there. All the things we talked about, things we have done, will be always there. We know exactly which one happened first, which one happened next. And also, we communicate with it uh, through audio too. So as soon as I see you over there, I say, can we talk? And we, you put the headset, I put the headset, we turn on the audio, and we talk. Okay? So it's very, very useful to do that. Use email for logging. What does it mean? If you want to have a timestamp on a message to later on to refer to, for example, something bad happened and you can't come for the test. So immediately you send me an email for that. I had an accident and I couldn't come to the test. So I can postpone, uh, give you more, uh, another chance to do the test, stuff like that. So important messages that you want to log to refer to later, you can do it with this one too, but email is more handy. And also I have my a phone number over there somewhere that you can call that one. That phone number actually rings in Microsoft Teams. It's a phone number of Microsoft Teams. It, call, it calls me on Microsoft Teams, and I can reply to you on that one too. So <clears throat> GitHub repository and everything is right there. If you want to know about Git, I wrote something over there, a little announcement over there to see what it is. So uh, if you want to actually learn how the Git works, Git has an open book. Who knows over here what is open source? Beautiful. OK. Open source, um, so uh, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, somebody called Linus Torvald uh, thought that uh, the Unix operating system is not a very uh, open uh, operating system that everybody can easily get and do, use. He was a genius, so literally in his basement on his computer, he created this operating system called Linux. Okay? Uh, that is the most reliable operating system in the world. Everything works on Linux these days. Everything. Okay? Actually, Linux is written in C, just for you to know. Okay? So Linux, it created this one, and it, and it made it open source. What does it mean, open source? It means it says, the operating system, not only it's free, but the program that I have written to implement it, everybody have access to it. So everyone from the, in the world started contributing to, it code, to its code. So they added features to it. They sent emails, hey, I, I have this feature that I, that it's, I think it's, it's going to be beneficial to the operating system. Let's add this one. Let's add that one. So features got added with, by everyone in the world. It became so complicated to keep track of all the people helping to contribute to the code of Linux that Linus created Git. What is Git? To manage all the code that is coming in and organize it so it can be contributed properly to Linux. And from there it got stuck. All projects in the world went to Git and they started working on that. And that's what you see. 
because it's open source and everything is open, the book for it is open too. So the Git open book, you click on that one, it's literally a book about Git. Read the first two chapters, around 60 pages, you know Git more than me. As simple as that. It's very simple. Okay? It tells you exactly what Git is, what is it good for, and all the good stuff. <clears throat> Subject online promotion policy, everything is in here, so you can actually go over there and take a look at the uh, subject website. And weekly schedule. This is my schedule over here. Um, uh, the offices that you see, if you click on the office, it brings you to the Microsoft Teams, the office thing, office thingy. It actually brings you up over there. So if you just click on the link, it brings you up to the office where you can actually send me messages. If you want, by the way, anything you write in the general thing, as I told you, everybody will see. If you have a private message to me, send it via uh, uh, um, a private uh, chat. So, and all of you are members of, these t of this team. So if I actually go over here, you will see. This is all of you. You see? I added everyone in here. So you are already a member of this team. And if I want to send a message to David over here, actually Emily is there, so I can just click over here and open up a chat and say hello. Is Emily here? There you go. Hello. There you go. Okay? So, and that happens like that, as easy as that. And she replies back. And we can actually open a chat session. I just click over here, and it's going to ring over there, and we talk. If you use the web version, if you use the web version, screens can only be shared visually. You cannot gain control. So I cannot, for example, share my screen and give you control to my screen and tell you, show me what is wrong with your code. So you can actually control my computer and explain. Okay? With... Uh, um, uh, with team, that's, that's the case. Anyways, <clears throat> all right. Thank you, Emily, for being the uh, person who let me demonstrate this thing. So uh, we'll go back to Teams, and that's where we are. Okay? Um, <clears throat> In here, we have all the... Uh, weekly schedule on what we are going to do, okay? So this week is going to be all about uh, introduction to Visual Studio. I'm going to explain exactly how things are, um, how the, the subject is going to go, set up our computers in the lab when you're coming, and all the things. And next week, we're going to start with uh, uh, language and, and go through C implementation and see exactly what it is and how it works. And I'm going to show you so many different ways to, to write your programs and see that you're going to be comfortable doing it on any computer. Okay? Uh, but remember, all the tools that you know becomes your assets. The more knowledge you have about tools, the easier you can sell yourself to companies. Remember that. Okay? So don't think that I'm overwhelming you with lots of softwares to install. <clears throat> Do it. Uh, even if you install it unsuccessfully, it's an experience. Okay? Try to do it. So anyways, on any of these, if you click on uh, the... The thing, it's going to actually take you to the place where the uh, book for it is. So you can actually study over there. These are introduction to C. You can go through everything that we have, computers, yada, yada, whatever. These are the things that I'm going to talk about, of course, now, as we are going through. But uh, um, the topics are all this. So that's the book that Chris Shavinsky wrote and uh, uh, one of our professors over here. And it's a very simple little thing that uh, has all the things that you need and nothing more. Um, what book to buy? That's the very first question that students ask. Um, we give you, uh, if you go to the course's website, it tells you uh, what is the suggested book to buy. Um, C language, with respect to age of languages, is ancient. I've been in like, like I've been in the computer business for around 35 years, 35, 40 years, and 
for me, it's as if I was alive 4,000 years. Okay? It's like that. C language is very old, very, very old. Because of that, there are so many textbooks out there that you can buy that you cannot believe. Okay? And the language changed, but not that much. Okay? So if your brother had, has that old C book that it has, you can still have that one to use. But I always tell to my students that telling you which book is good for you is like telling you which girl is good to be your girlfriend or which boy is good to be your boyfriend. I can't do that. It's your taste. Books are written by human beings. And because each person has specific type of flavor of understanding other human beings, if I were you, I would go to chapters in the go somewhere, go to the programming section, get six C books, Put it in front of me, one of the topics that you think is troublesome, go into index, find it, find it in those five books, and see which one you understand better. That's your book. Okay? The book that I like, maybe 80% is better than other books, but the one that you find is 100% better. Okay? And you can always, like these days, you can return the book in 15 days if you don't like it or something, right? So you can just bring it home, take a look at it. Please don't cut on the book like that, but just <laughs> read the book and see if you understand it. And I see everybody's faces are so serious. Come on. We, uh, we, uh, we're gonna, we'll try to, I'll try to act like a clown, jump up and down, try to make, say funny things and make you laugh. Please, it's a fun, fun thing we're going to do. Programming is fun. It's extremely boring to learn it, I know. But it's fun when you learn it. When you, when you actually learn how to program, it's the most fun thing to do. You can actually make that idiot do what you want to do. That idiot is the computer, by the way, right? <clears throat> so you essentially learn how to instruct the computer to do what you want to do. It's an amazing feeling, okay? Especially the first time you write a program. And then six years later, you see it's your baby that is doing the work over there. It's an amazing feeling, okay? Remember that, okay? Anyways, uh, so yeah, it's, everything's in here, and uh, uh, let me just see what else I have to talk about over here. Yeah, the addendum is over here that tells you, if you click on the addendum, it tells you exactly, like if you want to know what is worth, how much, what you're going to do. This is what it's going to be. So I'm planning to do the workshops this way. So uh, you're going to have a total of eight workshops. Uh, five workshops you're going to have before the midterm. And each workshop will have two parts. One part is the one we're going to do together in the lab. So you learn the concept. So it's very detailed. Tells you exactly how to do, what to use to do the task. And the second workshop is type of a DIY. I use the exact same concept to ask you to do something slightly different. And I want you to use that knowledge to do the same thing. And therefore, you learn. OK? That will be the first five workshops. The three workshops after only has part one. That is the learning part. It doesn't have the DIY. Why? Because that's when your project kicks in. For your project, I'm going to try to simulate a, a, a program to write that works in real world. Something very primitive. Something primitive that does something real. I don't know. Like, for example, searching for movies with concepts and see like, which movie is what. Or uh, writing a point of sale that sells stuff, reads barcodes and things like that, and gives you a bill at the end. Something, something but very primitive. Uh, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you in different milestones which means I'll give you a few uh, uh, primary milestones, milestone one, two, and three, for example, or four. We don't know how many. And these milestones that you get at the beginning um, literally builds the engine of the program that you want to write. And at the end, the last milestone, you're going to use the first f four milestones that you have created, tools that you have created. With that, you make your application work. Because of that, you don't have any DIY, because the project becomes your DIY.
So yeah, project, the 20% is, uh, is for the whole project, 10% is for those beginning milestones, and 10% for the final one. So these are all explained over there. Uh, quizzes, we're going to have around 12 quizzes. I'll try to make it 12. Uh, and uh, we drop the two lowest marks. Okay? So if something happens, you can come to a quiz, don't worry. Uh, the two lowest marks will be dropped. Uh, you're going to have two assessments, one midterm, the other one final, two assessments. Um, uh, they will be done on a computer, but it's as if you are doing it on a paper. So you're going to sit in a lab, open it, and, 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 and I'll actually give you a dry run test. I'll give you a test to play with to, before we do that so you learn how to work with it. You all go on a page, a page opens, the questions for the test come. You can bring your reference sheet, or I don't know, maybe it's open book, I don't know. You can bring your reference sheet and write, answer the questions as if you are doing it on a paper, and you submit it within the time that you're, that you're supposed to do it. Same thing for the final assessment. And read the course policies and all the stuff uh, to see exactly what you need to uh, do to pass the course. And this is the exact same uh, weekly schedule that you have it on, a, on, a, on, the, uh, on the page with links, without links. That one had links. And that's that. So I'm going to send you a detailed uh, information on which parts of Workshop Zero is done what, with what type of computer. So if you have a Mac computer, which parts of Workshop Zero you should do. And if you if I have Mac or Linux, or if you have a Windows computer, then do everything. <laughs> you don't need to worry about anything. It's the whole thing that you have to do. If you want to install VMware uh, uh, Fusion on your Mac, um, again, it's like you're buying a free computer. I, I would do it in a second. It will not reduce the power of your computer. Uh, Mac people, do you know what Boot Camp is? Any of Mac people know what Boot Camp is? <laughs> OK. It's not, I'm not sending you to a boot camp. <laughs> anyway, no, we don't know what a boot camp I'm not doing boot camp essentially a, a, a thing that you can actually install Windows on your Mac. So <clears throat> it divides your hard drive to two, and half of it becomes Windows, half of it becomes Mac. You can do that, but the problem is that you reduce the storage for your Mac by doing that. VMware doesn't work that way. VMware is an application that vi uh, um, simulates a computer. So a window in your, uh, in your uh, computer actually is I want to see if I have VMware here. No, I don't have it here. I just wanted to run a virtual machine over here and show it to you. But anyways, yeah, so it's in a window, you have Windows, <laughs> OK? And it works exactly like a computer. You, you shut it down, you have your Mac back with full power. So it, does, it occupies exactly how much you need on a hard drive. And as it expands, it makes the file bigger. So it doesn't occupy 100 gig of, of your 250 gig hard drive. Uh, and I know Apple hard drives are very expensive. So, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a good experience. But for that, you should have, there's Macs now, M something they call it, M3. I don't know what they call it. Macs that have mobile CPUs, those you can. It has to be a Mac that runs. Uh, OS X something. So you need to have uh, a Mac with a specific type of CPU because that, those are not CPUs powerful enough to run a virtual machine. So for that, I can't help you. Then you have to do everything on Mac. Anyways, but even Seneca sells computers. Uh, I'll show you the link and everything. Uh, that uh, like you can buy a brand new Dell laptop for 500 bucks with everything pre-installed on it. If you choose to do so, uh, that's your choice. Anyways, uh, let's get a break, and then we'll come back and we'll continue. Then I'm, and think about questions that you have, because I know you have some, hopefully. All right, let's continue. Uh, I'm not going to open up the other thing. People are just going to talk. I'm going to explain uh, <clears throat> what uh, Essentially, um, this is running. 
what programming languages are and what we are dealing with and all the good stuff that we need to know about C language. So, <clears throat> um, first of all, we need to understand what a computer is, okay? A computer is a machine that um, can accept instructions to perform certain tasks. Now, these tasks can be audiovisual. It could be physical, like, uh, uh, I don't know, you uh, uh, push a button and a screen comes down, um, things like that. So you can give instructions to a computer to do something for you. Now, all the computers, they have <clears throat> programs that manage the whole computer. Those programs that actually deal with the whole computer to instruct the computer how to do everything, to, for, to, for the computer to actually be able to accept programming, those programs are called operating systems. So an operating system is what you have on your computer for your computer to actually start working. Without that program, your computer is nothing. This probably has a Windows operating system. That is a Mac OS, now whatever the version is, and somebody else may have a Linux computer. Uh, it's Ubuntu, I don't know, Fedora, Red Hat, different types of names of operating systems. And all these operating systems' job is to manage the CPU, that is the central processing unit of your computer, to make your computer do things that it wants, it, it wants to happen. Okay, so now, <clears throat> operating systems can run programs on your computer. What is a program? A program is essentially a series of instructions that are written in a language we call binary. A binary language is essentially sets, set of zeros and ones, literally. Literally. How do they write a program? How do we, how do we communicate with that? You are doing it every day. Like when you are saying, okay, if there is a light on, it means they are at home. If light is off, they are not at home. So with the light being on and off, you can correspond it to certain type of action in your brain. That's a switch. If I have one switch, I can have two scenarios with it. I can have either off or I have it on. Well, hopefully that's a, uh, that's a whiteboard. I'm not going to write on a wall. <laughs> so... Let's do it uh, old style. And it's not going to be recorded, but hey. So when you have uh, a single byte, a single uh, switch, that switch can either be one or it can be zero. So this one can actually mean something. You can set it to be something and zero being set to something else. It's a switch a switch that you have, and that switch is connected to a light bulb, and the light bulb and a battery like that. So the switch is off, the light is off, you turn the switch on, the light goes on, right? Hence giving you a message. So a switch can give you two different positions, a zero and a one, correct? If I put two switches side by side, then what's going to happen? Two switches side by side. If I put two switches side by side, they can be both zero. The, it could be zero and one. It could be one or zero or one and one, correct? So how many different things I can show with two switches? Four, correct? Four different scenarios I can set with two switches. What if I have three switches? If I have three switches, it's going to be one, two, A 
eight positions. All zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, and it keeps going like that. Right? Hello. You're here for the Yeah. It's it's working too right. Let me just uh, pause the recording. So if I have three switches, I can show eight positions. And if I have four, how many I can show? 16, right? <clears throat> and they stop right over there. I'll tell you why. Actually, they didn't stop right over there. They went five. That was 32. Then they six became 64. Seven, 128. Eight, 256. Seven was enough because they wanted to tag the alphabet. They wanted to tag the characters in the alphabet. So when they were 64, they were, they were even good. How many characters we have in English alphabet? 26, multiply by two, that's 50, right? So with 64, we are good. But the problem was that then other characters come in, like punctuation, exclamation mark, column, semicolon, curly bracket. Then it went more than 64. So they added one more, 127, and they say, okay, seven. So seven is good enough. For a while, they actually stuck to that one. But then they, then they, then they notice that seven is not symmetric. You have seven, right? When I have eight, when I have 16, this is what I have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, one, two. When they put it like this, it was easy to refer to the bit pattern. These are each called a bit. A bit is a switch that can go on and off. They said, this is 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. They couldn't put 10 over here, then it would be confusing. So they said A, B, C, D, E, and F. And here comes the hexadecimal numbers. Because one digit corresponds to 16. So, so it's, uh, if we had eight fingers in each hand, that would have been our number. We have five in each, that's why we have zero to 10. 0 to 9, we don't have a 10. So in here, we have 0 to 15, we don't have a 16. So that's how they did it. And because if you have 7 bits, you cannot show it with two uh, hexadecimal numbers, they made it 8. So they said a byte is 8 bits. And <clears throat> they put, uh, uh, so, so, so they packed this 8 bits together electronically, they hard-coded it in your computer. They called that a byte. A byte is essentially a small number that starts from zero, goes up to 255. That's why they call this a binary language, binary uh, number. Binary number, a binary number is only zeros and ones. But they actually correspond to a real number. So you can actually calculate and see what is the outcome of of something like this. You can actually see what is this. This one is 6. This one is E. And E is essentially 10, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? So this becomes 12 plus 6 multiplied by 16. So the value of this number, this hexad this binary number is 6 multiplied by 16 plus 12 in decimal, in, in uh, base 10. We don't want to know that. Just let's understand that each bit, each bit pattern that you see is actually an integer number. It's a scalar number. It's an integer number, and it starts from 0, goes up to 255. So if they're all 0, that's zero. If they are all one, that's 255. And they made that the base of 
<clears throat> the memory of your computer. And they started actually coding characters in the computer with these numbers. They said, for example, 65 is capital A. <laughs> okay? So the number 65 is actually capital A. If you want to make it B, type 66. Okay? So that's how they did it. And they put all these things together back to back as, a, as an extremely long chain. They put it in your computer. They call it RAM. That's your memory of your computer. It's <clears throat> a huge chain of 8-bit packages one by one. Computer is not aware of existence of a bit. Computer only understands what is a byte. And that's the smallest number that it can hold. It's from 0 to 255. If you want bigger numbers, you have to put two bytes together. When you put two bytes together, it's 16 bytes, 16 bits. Therefore, it goes 2 to power 16, whatever number can it, it can be. If you want bigger number, you make it 4, it becomes a 32-bit integer. If you want a bigger number, you make it 64, it even becomes a bigger integer. But all it goes at the bottom is zeros and ones, and nothing but that. That's how to convert text to numbers and hold it in a computer. But what about the instructions? Instructions work the same way. So they said, for example, 0111011011011011 means repeat. You don't know this. You can't understand this. It's hard to grasp. But CPU understands it perfectly. When you give this number, it's hypothetical, by the way. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. If you give this to a CPU and put some other thing in front of it, it means repeat that one that much. OK? So things like that. So they started building languages like this. And it became very difficult to manage. They literally, for these zeros and ones, believe it or not, they had these board with wires. They would pull the wire, put it in some hole that becomes one, and pull the other and becomes zero. That would be crazy. So it didn't, like, it got improved. It got better and better, and it went through. And uh, uh, the languages became more sophisticated. Then they said, OK, this instruction that I'm actually writing, like, for example, in here, this instruction means jump. Go to some other instruction. The other instruction means add. The other instruction means subtract, things like that. They became too difficult to grasp. They said, let's actually name something. So for every individual, this CPU instruction, bit pattern, CPU instruction we're supposed to take, they added an equivalent English name. So they say add, which means whatever this instruction to CPU says, whatever you see over here, add it to previous number. And then subtract. Subtract becomes another bit pattern. They call this assembly language. Why? Because each command, English command, corresponded to a single CPU instruction. Extremely difficult to write. That was one of the most difficult subjects I took in computer science. Good news? Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. OK. OK. Oh, it's uh, all right, perfect. No, I don't need these. That's perfect. All right. Perfect. Thing. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so, so this, became, this became too difficult. It's called assembly language. And many people love that language because it's the most powerful language. You can do anything you want to do with a computer. So assembly language is 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. But how do I send a rocket to Mars from 2 plus 2? Big difference, right? Because of that fact, they said, OK, because this is very difficult, 
if I want to do a specific task, I have to package these things, package these instructions. Say this five instructions together means repeat. Okay? They put those five instructions together and gave it one name. Then they put this 10 instructions together, they gave it one name. They put 50 instructions together, called it print. They put 20 instructions over there, called it read. Because they had to write 20 instructions to read one character from the keyboard. So by doing this, the first languages came to be. So essentially, every language that you learn and you conveniently program on your computer, each verb of your language, each instruction of your language, expands to several assembly languages. Therefore, it's going to be able to be fed to the CPU, so CPU runs it and does something for you. And that's what programs are. The action of taking a program, the action of taking a program, that programming language, like C, like Pascal, like uh, C sharp, like Java, like JavaScript, the action of getting a language, a, 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 the text of a language, and convert it to that pure binary that you can actually give it to the, uh, to the operating system. So the operating system can give it to the CPU. So the CPU can run and tell, hello world. That action is called compilation. So you get your code, you give that code to another program that is written in some language, that program receives your code, translates, tries to translate everything, and convert it to that binary code, so it gets compiled. And then you can actually run it, and when it runs, you look at it, oops, it doesn't do what I wanted. Logical error, you go back and you do it again. Okay, so don't think that if your program compiles, everything's beautiful. Instructions can be something very bad. I can say, hit yourself, hit your head to the wall. That's an instruction. It's a bad one. Okay, the exact same thing happens in computers. You can write a program that is a bad instruction. It compiles. It means something. The syntax is correct. The grammar is right. But what you ask for it is illogical. We call those things logical errors. Compilation errors are easy to fix because the compiler cannot translate. You misspelled something. You didn't write the syntax properly. And <clears throat> what we are going to learn this semester is the syntax of C language. What Visual Studio is, is that compiler that translates that C language to a binary executable code so your CPU can run. Where in your Apple you have to use Xcode. Xcode is that compiler that gets C language and does it. But Visual Studio is not a compiler only for C. Visual Studio is a development environment. It has many different compilers in it. You can tell to Visual Studio to compile Python, compile COBOL, compile, I don't know anybody writes in COBOL in these days, but anyways, compile any language that you want, okay? But when you are working on a command line, not with development environments, then the compiler is specifically for that language. The compiler we're going to use is called GCC, GNU compiler. GCC, you give the GCC your file, and it compiles and makes the program executable so you can actually run it. This process of compilation is a complicated one. But in our case, we have one, two, three, four files to put together. So your program that you're writing, is a very, if it's a very simple one, you write only in one file. But I don't think any program in the real world is written in one file. You write it in one file, and the next chapter in another, another you have five files. You give all the five files to the compiler. Compiler compiles them individually and then puts them together, links them together, and makes an executable out of it. And that's what we're going to learn this semester. Okay? These things are kind of backtrack. First, you have it's computer learning computer programs like chicken and the egg. You don't know which one is coming first. Should I learn that one first, or should I learn? So this is called a low-level program. This is, I call it impossible, bro. Nobody programs in assembly, uh, in, in binary. 
Binary is always a result of something. So this is called assembly code. Assembly code is a low-level program. Okay, what is low level? A low level program is perfectly understandable for computers. Computers run low level programs like that perfectly. But it's very difficult for us to do. It's, e it's not easy for us to understand. A high level language, however, like JavaScript, it's very easy for us to understand. Like Java, like C, like C++. These are easy for us to understand, but difficult for the computer. For every instruction we write, hundreds of instructions are written for the, for the assembly code. And that's why our code that you are writing in C cannot be as efficient as an assembly code. With assembly code, you are essentially going with a needle and try to uh, uh, shape something. With, with C, you are going with a shovel. <laughs> it's not as easy to shape something with a shovel, right? It's the exact same thing. But through time, we're going to learn how to use our C language, C programming language, to write efficient codes too. Not only working, but also efficient. And that's one of the most important things I want you to remember as a student. As a student, you will write a program, and I'm going to tell you, why did you write this? You're going to tell me, but it works. That's the worst thing you can say to an analyst or a person who asks you to write a program. But it works is a very easy thing to do. You have to write a program that runs efficiently. So you can have five versions of the program doing the same thing. The one that runs faster is the one who becomes a billionaire. The rest, they just are some people wrote, wrote, writing some code sometime. Yes? It's not, actually, sometimes less line of code makes the program inefficient. Sometimes you have to write more lines to, there's a trade-off. Thank you for the question. When you're writing a program, there's a trade-off in your program writing. Your program, what, you, what, do you, what do you expect your program be efficient in? Using less memory or running faster? Or using less hard drive, I don't know, like so permanent memory, whatever. So the efficiency all depends on what you want to do. In our case, it's just speed, OK? Speed and style, which brings us to the next thing. I'm going to send you a link uh, about all these things, style of programming and everything. So at the beginning of that, when you, when you click on types, I can actually show you here now. So when you're actually going to the site and you click over, uh, Uh, when you're going to here, weekly schedule, when you click here, start from the beginning, okay, introduction. You're going to go through all these things and, and you'll see. You see over here style guidelines when we, when we get a little further forward? So st start reading with computer information, compilers understand those things. But when you are coming to style guidelines, you'll see that I have awful handwriting. I know everybody noticed, OK? But I have an excellent handwriting when it comes to computer programming. I call handwriting because sometimes programmers write programs that nobody understands. Because the style, the style of their code is so sloppy, it's difficult to follow. There are certain rules and regulations to program that you have to follow. I'll just give you a very quick example of what does it mean, style. Every single company has a specific type of rule in their coding style, how they name things and all those things. And they are strictly attached to it. Let's say you're working for Google. And right now, you just wrote a program that's going to give Google billions of dollars of benefit. That Google, that code that you have written, should be first checked by a person who commits the code. And they just take a look at your code, and you see the name of the variables you created didn't start with a capital letter, for example. They reject your code. If a code is not maintainable, it's worth nothing. And writing a maintainable code, it means following the standards of the community 
in which you are programmed. You may have your own style, that's very fine, but you should be able to quickly switch from style to style from one uh, company to another company. Don't worry, you are not supposed to learn anything new. They are all just going to tell you, instead of putting a dot over here, like instead of putting a curly bracket at the beginning, at the end of the line, put it at the beginning of the next. It's, there is, it's just style. The commands don't change. The syntax doesn't change. Everything is the same. They just ask you when you are indenting, make sure you only indent with three characters, not four. So when you are indenting your code, you're indenting your text, and you want to go one indentation further, three spaces is ruled for it, not four. And they stick to it. It's very important for them. And being organized in coding, I'll give you an example later on, helps you a lot. If you write a sloppy code, your brain cannot follow the logic. You can't follow the logic, you cannot find mistakes in it. You cannot find mistakes in it, that code is worth nothing. Because you will have a mistake in a code. It is, if you write a code one day, you compile and run it, and works perfectly, immediately run and buy a loto ticket. Because that's an impossibility. You write a code, you will make a mistake. And that mistake should be, able, is, should be easy to find if you follow the proper style. Are we okay with this? So, compiler, translator of the code. Code, C++, is it human language? Oh, sorry, C, <laughs> old habits. <laughs> okay, C language, C language. Is it a computer, pro, a computer language or human language? Human language, not computer. C plus C is human language. It's written for humans to understand. Remember that. Everybody thinks that C, C is a human language to interact with computers. So both understand. But it is understandable for humans. It's written for us. So, believe it or not, C language only has 13 keywords. That's it. Nothing else. 13, okay? Thir I see 13 commands. That's it. And that's it. And nothing else. And you do everything. Every other thing is just types and things like that. So, to grammar of the language to do all the actions, I think it's around 13, if I recall correctly, from old times. Okay? And with those, you can do everything. And um, what I'm going to, um, 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 the reason that I don't want to write the code, because I want you to write, grasp the concept first before we actually get into coding and everything. And I want you to do workshop zero. So for workshop zero, um, I actually put a message over there because it was originally created for OOP244. I actually put a smiley face over there and explain it to you too. Like when you are doing workshop zero, if you hear OOP244 or OOP345, translate it to IPC144. The concept and things are identical for all the subjects. It doesn't matter which subject. But because it was for OOP244, that's the way it's done. So it's just if I tell you, name your repository OOP244 works, make it IPC144 works because you're in IPC. And I'm going to fix that OOP244 thingy that we have with it. Again, my apologies on the OOP244 thing. All right. I'm going to scare you a little bit, but not really. Anybody knows what is a function in algebra? <laughs> you know what a function is? They say fx is equal to something. So. You write something like this, you say, do we have a, something to wipe the, oh, it's down here. And while doing this, uh, you have just, uh, is it 25 or 20, which one? No, what, the class ends at 25 or 20. Anybody knows? Ends at 25? Nice. I have five minutes more than, than I thought. <clears throat> okay, so what is a function in mathematics? Function is essentially, if you've ever seen it, like you're saying, uh, like you're saying fx 
is equal to x plus 2. You do something like this, right? And what does that mean? It means if I say f5, it means this is 7. You're okay with that? Right? You just put something for x and then c did that. C is, co is called the language of functions. Okay? So that's the first and last thing you see I saw I wrote over there about math. <laughs> okay. So uh, C is language of functions. So they gave you capability of packaging all the instructions that you write to C in C and put it in something called a function. And then call that function instead to organize your code. And C essentially works with that. Okay? So C essentially works that way. Um, um, I uh, would really love to write a piece of code, but I promised myself that I'm not going to write any code today. Um, but probably I'll write it over here for you, just for you to see, not on a compiler to run. <clears throat> C is language of functions. What does it mean? It means you write your code inside a function, and that function runs and does something for you. For example, and uh, this is how you do it. So essentially, an empty program that does nothing in C is this. An empty program that does nothing in C language is this. By the way, these are curly brackets. <laughs> My attempt to write the curly bracket. OK? So you're saying int main void and return 0. This is a, 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 a function that does nothing. And this is the beginning of everything. The, main, the name main is universal for, for C language. That's where everything begins. So you write a main and you start. So every application in C language, if you want to see how it works, you first have to find main, because that's where everything begins. So if I want to say, uh, if I want to have a program that says hello, uh, and then uh, asks how are you, and then uh, says goodbye, my program will look like this. Int main. In here, I'm going to say hello, and I'm going to say, how are you? And I'm going to say, goodbye, and then return zero. That's a normal C program. I'm saying, so then what I have to do after writing this, so I just use my imagination. There is no hello. There is no how are you in, in, in C language. Then I'm going to say, how I'm going to say hello? I'm going to go write a hello function the way it's supposed to say hello. Write a how are you function the way it's supposed to say how are you. Write a, a goodbye function the way it's supposed to say goodbye. And then run my main. Main will call hello. Hello will be done. Call how are you. How are you will be done. Call goodbye. Goodbye will be done. Program ends. The good thing about this is that I can write that in Farsi, and which language is your mother language? Is it anybody who speaks non-English? Spanish. So you can write the hello in Spanish and something, whatever. So I can write my main with my program that has hello and how are you and goodbye in Farsi. So my program is going to work for Farsi. Then I'm going to get his program. He wrote the hello and goodbye and something in Spanish. So now the program is going to work in Spanish. So I will write the, my uh, uh, kind of uh, imagination of what I want to do. How to implement it, I procrastinate. I put it for later. This is a beautiful practice. When you are writing a program, the best is always try to think of what you are doing and come up with made-up functions. You can write any function you want in C language. 
As a matter of fact, everything that you do in C language is done with functions. That's why I said it only has 13 keywords, 13, um, what should we call it, uh, uh, statements or commands in it. Okay? All the other things that you see in C language are written as functions and added to it. So if you want to print something on a screen, the name is printf, print formatted. If you want to read something from keyboard, you have to scan something. It's called scan formatted. So they wrote a function for it to do it. Okay? And all these things we're going to go through and, and we're going to do it together. So you will see later on that I'll start with functions because C is the language of functions. And if you learn to work with functions and deal with them, programming will be uh, nothing for you. Unlike real life, procrastination in programming is an amazing thing to do. When I ask you to write whatever you are supposed to do, to write a program about anything, in your mind you can divide it into steps that are supposed to be done. Anything, recipe for a cake, anything you want to do, they can be uh, divided into steps, correct? You can name those steps, correct? Those names become the names of the functions. And you implement every single step individually. Therefore, your brain doesn't have to get occupied with the whole concept to write. When I divided the greeting uh, program of mine in hello, how are you, and goodbye, when I'm doing this, I only have to think about how to say hello properly and think of nothing else. When I'm done with that hello, I forget about it. I know it's implemented. I don't need to worry about it. Now I only think about saying, how are you? And get the response back. And when it's done, I completely forget and put it aside. And when I'm going to do goodbye, then I'm going to only think about goodbye and nothing else. And that's how you program. You procrastinate into actually implement. You try to make it as much as possible Break it down into pieces. It's exactly like I ask you, there are 10 suitcases over here. Please move them over there. It is impossible to grab the whole thing. But if you take them one by one and put it over there, it's an easy thing to do. That's programming. When I get, tell you to do a ginormous thing to, do, uh, to implement, your skill, your experience where you are learning in Seneca College would be to be able to break that down into pieces and focus on individual small pieces instead of a big picture. And then assemble them back together and you have a beautiful program to write. Okay? So please, start workshop zero. Uh, if you uh, have an apple, just do the Git parts for now. I'm going to explain which one to, uh, to do. So I'm going to put an announcement in Teams and send an announcement in uh, uh, Blackboard as an email for now, but later on everything's going to be in Teams. Please, inst so your uh, uh, task number one, install Microsoft Teams. Task number two, go through workshop zero and see what you can do on your computer. You'll see if it's Windows, forget about it. When it says Mac, do the Mac, okay? Do all the steps that you can in, in workshop zero, and I'm going to uh, do the announcement by the end of today. So you're going to receive the announcement and see what the details are. Oh, yes, that, that thing too. All those things I'm going to send. Yeah, there's no, no problem. OK. I thought I actually, quite frankly, I have to uh, 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 kind of confess to that. I thought I have it, but I looked at it. It wasn't there. So probably I was too sleepy at night and I didn't add, save the last thing. I thought I had those things. But yeah, there's, it's there. I actually looked at the prices. It was uh, like the one that is like uh, $500, uh, $500. It's like 8 gigs of RAM and lots of good stuff in it. So it's, it's good. And the one that goes $1,000, it goes 16 gigs. So it's a beautiful one. Yes. If you have VMware, don't buy anything. VMware will do everything for you. A VMware Fusion? Yeah, if you can. I, check first. Go to... When, 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 I gave, when I put the links over there, click on it. See what are the system requirements first. 
Google it. So I, I don't know what kind of an apple you have, okay? Is it red and red delicious one? <laughs> yes. Oh, you are? No, no. Thank you. With your Seneca comes everything that you want for accounts. Seneca is a Microsoft-friendly thing. Your accounts are actually Microsoft accounts. So your My Seneca is a Microsoft account. When you download Visual Studio and Visual Studio says, log in, put your Seneca ID in there. It's a Microsoft account. Yes, sir. No, that, I think it's a few days. Not next week, this week. Friday, yeah. In like a couple of days. Sure. <laughs> okay, but th th yeah, uh, these are your homeworks for IPC. Okay, so I'm going to uh, put more announcements. As soon as you get on Teams, try to contact me. Okay, send the chat, say hello. I want to see that you successfully did that so we can talk on Teams and get used to it. Uh, one more thing I wanted to say. We don't have time. Have a good day. Bye-bye. I'll talk about it next day.